I met um, a mayor of Rivne, and he was on the news uh, because he speaks English. Uh, mayor of Rivne was a very unique meeting with him. He gave me a history of Pentecostal movement in the Ukraine. And in that Pentecostal movement, there is two old dudes are there, black and white photos. The first one is his great grandfather. His great grandfather was the first pastor in this particular village where the Pentecostal movement did not begin necessarily, but it really was highlighted. Now in this village, his great grandfather was the pastor, but because he was getting persecuted a lot, they replaced him with my grandfather. Now, the reason why they put my grandfather is because my grandfather, uh, like, he was, he had a problem, I think, with his, um, one of his um, legs. And so he was walking a little bit like this. And the Soviet, Soviets were a lot more sympathetic to people who looked like they were handicapped. And so they put him in. And he was there actually as a pastor for, if I'm not mistaken, about 20 years. So this was a very unique meeting because the mayor of Rivne meets with me and he shows me the article of the official history of the Pentecostal movement in the Ukraine. And he said, listen, he said, my great-grandfather was the first pastor of this village. He said, your grandfather was the second pastor. And he says, look, years later, we're together. I'm the mayor and you're the pastor in America. He said, how awesome is that? I was like, yeah, I guess. But I was just reminded that my grandfather was a hero. <laughs> and uh, then I read the story. It's in Ukrainian, so it's very difficult to understand. Pure Ukrainian is hard to understand even for Ukrainians. For those of you who know, say amen. And I read the story and I find out that my grandfather, um, my grandfather, Ivan, was actually a leper. Missionaries came into the village to tell about Jesus and they witnessed to, that, to his family. And his father, which is my great-grandfather, Lazarus, he hears the gospel, invites the missionaries, and then the missionaries pray for my grandfather, who his name is Ivan, like this Ivan, and he had leprosy and God supernaturally heals him of leprosy. And then my family from my father's side accept Jesus Christ and then later on he becomes a pastor. And so I want to today use that as a foundation to start with this, how important healing is, not only to advancing the gospel. See, the healing for my grandfather, it wasn't about the gospel only. It was about his health. But healing is something that also helps to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to speak today about experiencing healing today. God is still in the business of healing people. Now in our church, we pray for healing a lot. Anytime we have a sickness or somebody falls into, we right away rally the troops and we pray for healing. We pray for healing every single month where we call out words of knowledge or we invite people to the front and anoint them with oil. We don't teach a lot about it. It's about practicing it. But today I want to just talk about it for just a few moments. In James, it's James chapter 5. It says, if anybody is suffering, let him pray. If anybody is happy, let him sing songs. And then it says this, if anybody is sick, let him call elders and let the elders anoint them with oil so that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Sometimes people think that the New Testament puts sickness under the umbrella of suffering. But James makes a distinction between suffering and sickness. Because in your suffering, you pray to get through it. You pray that God will help you to endure it, but in your sickness, you pray a prayer of faith so you can engage and receive healing. And so I just want to encourage your faith today. There's six main stances concerning the topic of miracles. The first one is anti-supernaturalists. These are the people who believe that anything supernatural in the Bible is fabricated. God doesn't do miracles. Everything, God just uses science or God just uses natural processes. The second stance concerning miraculous, these are hardcore cessationists. These people, they reject supernatural manifestations. They don't embrace miracles. They don't believe in demonic possession today. Their view is that God can perform miracles and He did only to help write the Old and the New Testament. And once the canon is closed, God zipped His lip and God stopped healing and God stopped doing anything that's supernatural, because why would He want to do that if the Bible is already completed? Then the third category are the softcore cessationists. 
These are the people who believe that God can do miracles, but we shouldn't expect them. God can do miracles, but it's mainly in Africa, India, Siberia, and somewhere where the gospel has not been preached and God cannot get through them, through the preaching. So like God uses a miracle out of his pocket to really get through people. And once he gets them, then he connects them to the word and miracles are no more. Then there's a fourth category of people and these are believing continuationists. Believing continuationists are those who believe that miracles have continued since the days of the death of the apostles and the writing of the New Testament. They believe all the right stuff. There's just only one problem. They actually don't practice it. They believe that miracles can happen, deliverances can happen, they just don't happen with them, through them and by them. Predominantly that's kind of how a lot of the Pentecostal and even charismatic churches and believers even in the United States today. The fifth group of people and these are I would say we are around that not to brag just just slightly to brag about us and these are practicing continuationists who believe that God can do miracles, expect these miracles and take step of faith to see these miracles happen. Come on somebody, any practicing continuationists we have here. You're like practicing what? Just believer. The sixth group and this is the one that gives us bad rap and that's the abusing continuationists. These are the people who will heal only if you give them a certain amount of money. These are the people who will exalt the prophecy above the written word of God and people who have abused the ministry of the supernatural. But just because there's an abuse of something it does not cancel the use of something. Just because the devil abused the scriptures taken out of the context in the wilderness, Jesus didn't drop the scriptures say, okay, I can't quote the scriptures. I'm going to quote now one of the Greek philosophers. Why? Because the devil has abused the scriptures. We stick with the word of God and we believe God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He still heals, he still delivers and he still saves. So many Christians trip up over the Paul's thorn in the flesh. But what about the thorn in the flesh of the Paul? Now we don't know exactly what Paul's thorn was. It seems like that it was as Paul describes a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, to, 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 to torture him, to torment him. But let me just remind you, you and I are not Paul. The anointing upon your life as great as it is, does not require a thorn. And if you need one, God has given you kids and a wife. <laughs> A husband <laughs> or gas prices. <laughs> we all got that thorn. But most likely the thorn in Paul's flesh was the persecutions that he endured. But let's just say for, let's just say for a moment that it was a sickness. Come on, we don't look at Paul's thorn, we look at the stripes of Jesus. Yeah. Healing comes from what Jesus did on the cross, not for what, what happened to Paul or what happened to Job. I want to encourage your faith today. If you have your Bible, let's go together with me to uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. This is the story of Naaman who was a leper and Naaman captures people and brings them into his house and captures this little girl. And when she sees that even though he is a leper, he was still a successful soldier and a successful general, which let me just stop for a moment. I love the fact the Bible highlighted that Naaman was not stopped by his sickness. So many people use their sickness as an excuse not to do anything with their life. Now I understand some sicknesses, they literally make you immobile for you can't do anything. But Naaman was a leper and in that day lepers were removed from the society. Somehow he was able to still fight, win and the Bible says he was used by God. He was still used by God though he was a leper. No matter how great your sickness is, don't make your sickness your God. It may restrict you but it shouldn't stop you. Come on somebody. And so Naaman, he is successful. Naaman, he is a soldier, he is a general, he is used by God and he has a leprosy. And it seems like sometimes we look at people who are successful or maybe you're one of them. You have a blessing in your life and you got a little problem in your life. And when you don't see healing or you don't see health for a, for a long time, you start developing philosophies. I remember talking to this um, great man of God uh, this week. He has a terminal illness 
we were praying for his healing and everything and we were talking and and he went from you know saying that he believes in God to heal him to he says you know what I know why God let me have this sickness so and I'm like I'm all ears man tell me what did you learn he says if it wouldn't be for this sickness I probably would have committed adultery and he's like man this sickness has really kept me from a lot of sin and I get what he's coming from that it's teaching him He's learning and that's how a lot of believers are. The moment you first believe for healing and it doesn't happen, you become a philosopher. You right away develop ideas. They're not always anti-biblical. Sometimes they're extra biblical but nevertheless they're not biblical. And so and I'm listening to this and I get it. I sympathize and I was like yeah I, I get I, I feel you bro. Like that's totally makes sense. Like you probably would have done this and done that. But see the problem is that when you begin to give sickness this improper place, it's hard to fight against something you deemed as good for you. Now is it true that God can teach us a lesson through it? Yes He can. Is it true that when you stay long in it, God is so good in His mercy and grace, can use anything to modify your character, sanctify you and develop you. Yeah, yes He can. But please be careful not to make a doctrine out of your prolonged experience. It's important to stick with the Bible even if it seems to contradict what I'm going through. And we don't need to give our sickness a good rap just because we can get rid of it. Just because I've learned something, just because I got sanctified, I became more patient, I became more humble, more dependent, it does not mean that that is from God and God has sent it or God has condoned it or God wants it in my life. Now let me go a step further. If sickness is that great, why take vitamins? If, if it's a, such a great blessing from God, why go on dialysis? If it's a tool in God's hands, why destroy it? But what we do typically is we come on Sunday and we play this God, your will, whatever you want God, I'll take the sickness. And then on Monday we go at nine o'clock in the morning to the doctor and say, doctor get rid of it. <laughs> come on doctor, fight, come on. Is there any new treatments? Come on. Is it, come on, my insurance can't cover that new treatment? And so I'm like, so what happened on Sunday? Why was faith used in its minimum? to fight against it but the medical insurance is maximized to its maximum to get rid of it. If sickness is really God's blessing, why was the body God created always fights against bacteria, virus and disease? How did God create it in such a way where even when you sleep your body is like an army? It's called immune system. It fights against disease. Like you cut yourself, your body will heal itself. Your body has a healing mechanism. Some of us, you know, there's some people who went to a theolog theological school and they were taught that healing is not for today. God doesn't want to heal. Healing, sickness is good for you. Let me just for a moment, why don't you take a lesson from your biology? You can get a lot of theological understanding by looking at how your body works. It fights against disease. And your body did not even go through theological school, praise God. Your body was created to fight against sickness and disease. Medicine fights against sickness and disease. And sometimes we come to church and we're just not sure. And we're sure in the beginning is just the moment we get used to it, we domesticated it and now our insurance covers it. We're like, you know what? I can still work. I'm still winning. I'm still being used by God. You know what? Maybe this leprosy thing, it serves some good. It keeps me in balance. God is trying to help me appreciate the good things I have in life. You know what, maybe it's because I, you know, I've done some bad things and, but God's mercy is still there. I want to tell you something, God has a way of helping us to keep the balance, but that is not through sickness. God will give you critics, persecution and hardships, but sickness is not one of them. What I'm saying is that I want you to be aggressive against sickness. Why? Because your body is. Your body is fighting it every day. In fact, when your body stops fighting against sickness, that's when you know you have another sickness. 
When, you, when your immune system stops fighting, that's not healthy. That's a bad thing. And so for Christians, I want to encourage you Christians, we are to embrace suffering. We're not running from hardships and sufferings. But when it comes to a sickness, James tells us this, he says, call the elders. Not so he, they can pray a prayer of strength, but so they can pray a prayer of faith, so God can heal you in Jesus' name. Come on somebody. Amen. If you're taking notes, I want to share just um, three simple thoughts concerning healing. Number one is that healing comes by faith and faith comes by hearing. As Naaman, his faith that God can heal him came from a little girl whom he had in her house, in his house. Now the Bible says that each one of us as believers have a measure of faith. That means that as a Christian, the moment you became a Christian, God has already given you a little portion of faith. You have that faith. But this faith can grow. How does this faith comes? How does this faith grows? It grows through hearing. Now every one of us has a little girl in our house. And this is not a little girl, I'm just using it for the sake of the analogy. But some of us do not trust this word because we think, what can it do? I don't feel inspired, Vlad, when I read this. The doctor's report are more real. The symptoms are more real. They've been prolonged and the Word of God says, yeah, I get it, but you know, you know, and then there's the, our butt part always gets in and makes the Word of God of no effect. Some of us have been poisoned by traditional teaching that sickness is from God, God doesn't heal today, that it hinders the flow of God's Word. It's like we put a duct tape and a zipper on this, on this Word speaking in our house and says, listen, you can actually be healed. You know what, if you go to Samaria, like if you go to the front and if you trust, if you ask one of the brothers and sisters to pray for you, you can actually be healed. And we're like, nah, man, I tried that. Nah, that's, that stuff is just, that's just a lot of emotionalism. Nah, I don't believe in that. I want to tell you something, if you humble yourself and you accept what the Word of God says, you will have faith. And faith will lead you to your miracle. Now the little girl told Naaman, if he goes to Samaria, he will be healed. Let me tell you what God's Word says. It tells us that it is God's will to heal you. When a leper came to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're willing, heal me. Jesus says, hold on buddy, I am willing, be healed. That settles it for us. Does God want to heal you? He already answered that, He's willing. He wants to heal you. What about, you know, just because God is willing, it doesn't mean He's going to do it. You're right. Can He do it? The Bible says the healing is not just something God does, it's someone He is. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my healer. Now I could be willing, for example, to give Ivan a house. I'm willing to give you a house. But it's a different when I go in and I promise to give him a house. Don't worry, I won't be making those promises because everything's recorded right now. But let's say that I am willing to make him a house. There's just only one problem is I only have one house and that one is not even paid off. So I can't really give him a house. But let's just say miraculously one of you gives me a check today and I pay off my house. I give him a house. The problem is that I only have one. So if I give him, I don't have it for another person. See healing is not just something God has that if he gives it to you, he has it less for you. Healing is he's someone he is. He is a healer. He doesn't lose it by giving it to you. He doesn't lose it from somebody else. He has enough of it and he doesn't just want to heal us. He promises to heal us. In Psalm 100 it says this, bless the Lord O my soul and he says forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all of your sins and he heals all of your diseases. That is the promise. He didn't say some of them. He didn't say just the back pain, just the easy ones. He says all of the diseases. He's like, no, God was exaggerating. Well, the verse before, he says he forgives all of your sins. God wasn't exaggerating on that. You won't go into God's like, yeah, God only forgives the big ones, but not the small ones. No, God forgives all of our sins. And that means that God heals all of our diseases. That is a promise. God doesn't throw words in the air. God doesn't brag. God doesn't exaggerate. God means what he says. Come on, somebody. God is willing, God is a healer, He promises to heal. But you know what one thing that gets me all the time? Where my faith comes from is the fact not only God promises, God wants, God is a healer, but it's the fact He paid for it on the cross. My faith comes from the fact that Jesus Christ healed, the Bible says, because He bore their sicknesses upon His body. 
Now, there's a famous thing that is going around. Jesus took 39 stripes and it represents 39 root sicknesses. And I said it before and I apologize. That's actually not accurate. There's not one instance in the Bible that says Jesus got hit with 39 stripes. The idea that Jesus got hit with 39 stripes, it's a Jewish law that you couldn't hit anybody more than 39 stripes. The problem is Jewish people were not beating Jesus, Romans were. And they did not have that law. Regardless, he was beaten for our, for our sickness, the Bible says. Regardless, the Bible says clearly is that he was scorched for our sickness, which means that Jesus not only wants to heal us, not only he is our healer, not only he promises to heal us, but Jesus actually purchased our healing. So today it's not about God, please heal me. Today it's about something else. What is that? That's point number two. So not only I get my faith for a miracle from God's Word, but secondly is that we must release our faith by speaking to our disease. Now that's not what this says over there, but I'll get to that. We must release our faith. We receive our faith by God's Word. We release our faith by exercising our authority. I want you to notice when Naaman received this faith from a little girl who told him you can be healed. I want you to notice what the little girl told Naaman. She says this to him, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria for he would heal him. The girl did not tell Naaman that Elisha would pray for you. This girl has some faith. This is what she says. He says, my prophet would heal you. Wow. Like, like lay hands and like pray? No. He heals. Oh, I thought God does that. All right. Yeah, he heals. That's weird. He will heal? Like, whoa. That's, that's, that's pushing it. So the guy writes a letter from his master employer, comes to the king of Israel. Here's Naaman, he is sick, heal him. The king rips his clothes and says, am I God? I can't heal anybody. What do you, who do you think I am? I'm not that kind of guy. And when I read that, I'm like, yeah, that's how I feel most of the time. When the sick person comes in like, I mean, there's nothing I can do. I'm just, I'm just a fragile, just, just the weak worm of the dust. I, I can heal, only God can heal, I'm not, I'm not God. And we feel, we connect with that king and that's why most of us don't see healings. The next verse, it says the prophet Elisha heard that. He sends a messenger to the king and he says, fool, what are you doing? He said, why did you rip your clothes? He says, send that guy to me so that that guy will know there's a prophet in Israel. It seems like Elisha is walking around like he is God. He's not. But see, Elisha walks in authority. And see, when you don't walk in authority, you're only talking to God about the issue. When you walk in the authority, you talk to the issue about God. It's a completely different game. Come on, somebody. Now, when you begin to feed yourself with God's Word, you will come upon the instruction in God's Word. Dear friends, listen very carefully. That in the New Testament, Jesus did not pray for the sick. He healed the sick. He came to the blind people. He didn't say, Father, if it's your will, he said, be opened. He didn't come to the Lazarus tomb and says, Lord, raise him from the dead. He says, thank you for hearing me every time I pray. Lazarus, come out. Disciples did the same. They came to the temple and they saw a lame man lying there. They didn't raise his hands and say, let me just pray for you. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, if it's your will, please heal him. No, they looked at that man and they said, we give you what we have. Get up and walk. They healed. They didn't pray for healing. Now, is it wrong to pray for healing? Of course it's not. But the biblical way is not to pray for healing. It's to heal. The biblical way is not the way of the king of Israel. <gasps> I don't have anything. It's the way of the prophet. Gold and silver I don't have. Now unfortunately we do have gold and silver except the other part we don't have. <laughs> it's that I know who I am. What is the difference between the king and the prophet? It was one simple thing. The king was aware of what he did not have, who he was not. Prophet was aware of who he was and who God was in him. 
The more you focus on your godliness, on your own faith, on your own goodness and everything, you will always feel inadequate. It will never be enough. But when you take your eyes off of yourself and you fix your eyes on who Jesus is, on His Word and on His promise, something happens. Faith will bubble up and authority will begin to flow through your life. The Bible says the name of Jesus is power. There is this thing in the United States called the power of attorney. The power of attorney is if somebody else has access in case you encapis in case, uh, yeah, in case you can't fully function or you're maybe in a coma or something and somebody else has the power to make decisions on your behalf. Now power of attorney is the legal document where the doctor, the, the, the lawyers, the, the judge, everybody else now has to trust your what you say on behalf of somebody else. See when Jesus went to heaven, He left us His name. He gave us the power of attorney. That's why the sickness has to obey because the sickness understands not your power, the power of His name, backed up by the Holy Spirit, backed up by the power of God. When you speak, the power speaks. When you move, the power moves. When you declare, the power declares. That's why the Bible says if anybody has faith and they speak to this mountain, it shall be moved. You can prophesy to the dry bones. You can speak to that situation and it will happen. Come on somebody, give God some praise right now. Give God some glory right now for the power of His name, for the power of His blood, for the power of His name. Small faith talks to God about our situation. A great faith speaks to our situation. But I want to encourage each and every one of you today. While we do pray for healing, anoint with oil, but we know that the command Jesus has given us is that the power of God is released when we understand who Jesus is, who we are in Him, not how weak and fragile we are, which we are, but how great He is. The moment we take our eyes off of ourselves, His power will begin to flow. I am always reminded that the first healing that happened in the Bible, at least the first healing that is mentioned in the Bible, happened when Abraham prayed for the wives of Abimelech. Abraham was caught in a lie of saying that his wife was his sister and having a weakness of faith. God rebuked Abimelech and told Abimelech, you are a dead man because you took somebody else's wife. Abimelech of course said, in innocence of my hands and the integrity of my heart I did that. God, I did not know. God's like, I know that. I get you. But now in order to experience healing from barrenness, you need to do something. And this is one of those ridiculous stories for me personally in the Bible, especially when it comes to healing. God says, I want you to call Abraham. Now remember, Abraham is the one who lied to Abimelech. And God calls Abraham prophet. The first mention of the word prophet in the Bible is in this story. So the first healing in the Bible, the first time God speaks in the dream in the Bible, and the first mention of prophet is in this story. Now think about it. Poor Abraham had a very low dose of faith. Okay, put his wife, literally threw his wife in the court to be somebody else's wife. God comes to Abimelech and says, Abimelech, I got you and I'm gonna heal all the women in your court. There's just one thing. Abraham is my prophet and he needs to pray for healing. Now Abraham has never seen a healing. His own wife is barren. Imagine Abimelech coming and say, Abraham, you lied to me. I'm sorry, Abimelech. I just, you know, just had a really low dose of faith. I should have not done that. Yeah, and God said, you need to pray for my wives to be healed of barrenness. Abraham's like, uh, newsflash, my own wife is barren. We don't like do that stuff. We're still believing for a miracle until then. I cannot give you what I don't have. And I think that's when Abimelech took another step. And he says, did you know what God called you? What did he call me? Prophet. Do you call me prophet? Really? Prophet? Like not pathetic prophet but like real prophet? Because I mean I kind of lied. I was not. Yeah, he called you a prophet. And I think when Abimelech told Abraham that God called you a prophet, I think Abraham's faith bubbled up. I was like, I think I am. <laughs> I had a weak moment yesterday but today I think I'm good. <laughs> where's, the, where's the women? Line them up. <laughs> Let's go fire. Pa, 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 pa. And they all conceived and Abraham's wife was still barren. That tells me that just because you're still battling with the sickness, it doesn't mean that God cannot use you. Sometimes it's easier to experience a healing through you than in you. 
Sometimes it's easier to believe for somebody else than to believe for yourself. But sometimes God will stretch your faith and say, I want you to believe for somebody else. I want you to pray for somebody else. But you will, you will feel inadequate. You will feel not good enough. You will feel like, man, but I said some things. I did some things. I, I, I didn't read enough of Bible and everything. But it's never about you. It's not about your character. It's about your identity in Jesus Christ. We should always work on our character. We should always grow in our godliness. But the power of God that lives inside of us flows through our faith in who Jesus is. That's why you can heal the sick, cast out demons and prophesy and live your life practicing lawlessness. You may say, how is that possible? It's easily possible. When you know who Jesus is, you can live a bad life and still be used by God. Now, God is not advocating that. But how many people we know that live a holy life and never let God use them? Why? Because of cockroaches in their head. I'm not good enough. You will never be good enough if you compare yourself with yourself. If you take your eyes off of yourself and you say it's about Jesus. I'm growth in progress. I'm growing in the Lord. I am knowing the Lord and I'm going to give what I have and what I have is the name of Jesus. I'm a legal representative of God on this earth and it is God's will to destroy sickness. It is God's will to heal the sick. It is God's will to drive out demons. I might not feel good today. I might even have a pinky that is hurting today but it's the name of Jesus Christ that heals the sick and He will use me today to heal the sick. He will accomplish His purpose and His will through my life. Hallelujah! And the last thing I want to share is that miracles happen when we don't give up until we get an answer. Naaman gets, goes to the king. The king says, I can't do this. The prophet says, I can come to me. And then he comes to the prophet. And you know, Naaman has watched a lot of YouTube videos. He's seen how the healings are done. And the Bible says he had this expectation. I think he's probably heard that, that uh, prophet Elisha does this thing with his hand because he was expecting the prophet Elisha would wave his hand over the sickness of Naaman. So he comes, he's expecting, he got the gifts, he got the, the photos, the videos for the testimony purposes of course. And so he's waiting for that and Elisha doesn't even come out. The guy doesn't even give him the courtesy of his presence. He sends one of the guys and he gives him these simple instructions. He says take right, left, straight and then go over there. There's a river over there. It's pretty dirty, cold and not comfortable. Seven times bro. One, two, three, four, six, seven. Seven times and after that your skin will be as good as the baby's skin. And that was so offensive to Naaman. Because here is his test, the test of faith now. When what you were expecting, it's not happening like that. And then you ask yourself a question, do I still want to be healed or do I want things my way? Healing can happen instantly. Healing can happen progressively. That's why the Bible says that they shall recover. Recover is a process. Sometimes it happens instantly. Sometimes it happens by a process. Sometimes it happens when you came for healing and you got delivered. You're like, that's not what I was expecting. Sometimes you come for healing, you were hoping that that pastor or that leader will pray for you and they didn't pray for you. They sent one of the newbies. Sometimes they prayed but you really hoped that they would take it deeper with you like to you know really go deeper and they just touch you like that's it? Come on man, I've been tithing for three years. Where is my like three minutes? Like you know put your fingers into my head and like you know twist that sickness out. Do something with me. I need to be healed. Give me more attention. At the end of the day, we have to be more committed to experiencing God's healing in our body than the means and how it's going to take place. I want to encourage every person today. Today can be the day of your healing. If you've been waiting, you've been expecting, maybe you're fighting for the health of your body, the health of your family or one of your family members and maybe you have learned to manage it live with it. It still doesn't change the fact God loves you so much and He wants to heal you. We're not pushing healthy, wealthy gospel. What we are preaching is Jesus died on the cross for our sin and He wants to heal us of our diseases. Our bodies are the tools in the hands of God. God wants to restore you and heal you. God wants to bless you today. He wants to meet you at the point of your need. His name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. My faith is stirred up, not just to talk about healing, but to see it manifest. Now manifest not as a new age word manifest. We're not going up to God and trying to twist God's arm to give a healing. As we've heard today, He already has given that to us. We're not trying to get anything from Him, 
we're trying to collaborate with him to see it happen and manifest on this earth. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to hungrygen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.